it is time for the most comprehensive overview of the Clavia Warskowskii that you've ever seen. Hello, this is Sarah Soil Plant and welcome back to my channel. It's that time again. I posted a video like this on my Calathea White Fusion last year and this year I'm picking out a different Calathea that is one of my favorites, especially right now, and that is my Calathea Warskowskii. Just like last time, I have tons of notes that I have made about this plant and I will be reviewing all of that for you right now. But first, let me introduce you to my Warskowski eye. Uh, it's got some nice gigantic paddle leaves and it's got a bunch of different growth points at the bottom down here, but don't worry, I will go over identification and unique markings and all of that for this plant just in a moment. The Warskowski eye or the jungle velvet as it's also known is pretty well renowned around the plant community for its beauty. I've had this particular one for about two years when I bought it from a local nursery for $29.99. In the process of making this video, I did quite a bit of internet sleuthing and research. All of this sleuthing was done to basically get together as much information about this plant as possible and hopefully give you the most accurate information you can about this particular plant. To make it easy for you, I will follow this particular outline. I will also link the timestamps below so you can jump to whatever you need in order to figure out how to care for these things. So first of all, this plant is technically a Gapertia, not a Calathea anymore. It was reclassified. I will kind of use them interchangeably, but I'm hopefully just going to be referring to it as the Worsk Whiskey Eye, but I do slip up, so apologies ahead of time. These plants are native to Central and uh, Northern South America, so you know, your Panamas, Costa Rica, Central America, just kind of in that region. A lot of Calatheas tend to be from there, and these ones are similar. These plants are what is known as understory plants. That means that these are going to be found really close to the ground. They can handle lower light as compared to plants that are higher up and vine up trees. These grow in bushels that are on the ground, and they don't really vine or climb. They just kind of stay in their bushels and replicate by a bushel. One of the signatures of Calathea is the motion of the leaves, and these ones, even though the leaves are like big broad petals and can be quite gigantic, they do also move, not quite as exaggerated as say a Maranta or some of the regular Calatheas that you can find, because the leaves are so huge and have a decent amount of weight to them, they don't really go up all the way, but they do move up and down kind of in a motion. I'll get more into this later, but Calathea do like a little bit more moisture in their soil and also like higher humidity, but I will get more into that later. So while the Warskowskii does have some of the signature hallmarks of a Calathea, I do find that these are especially unique compared to other Calathea across the spectrum. And I will demonstrate on this leaf here, the leaves have a very long oval shape, almost like a canoe. The front side of the leaf will have a dark green back and will have that light green sort of fishtail in the middle. That middle green is basically just like a standard medium tone green, but up against the darker coloring, it definitely has a lighter appearance. And then that light pattern makes a kind of fishtail down the center there on either side. It's very, very, very pretty. You can also tell on the edge when you're looking at it, there is a very, very slight ruffle to it. It's not quite Roof of Barbara territory or even Lancifolia territory, but it does have a very slight ruffle to it. And of course, one of the stunning things about this plant is it has the deep maroon sort of, I don't know what this color is, plum a very plum coloring on the back of the leaves. And if your plant is healthy, then the entire back should be a dark, dark, plummy purple, just like that. And the reason this plant gets the name Velvet Touch is because one of the things about this plant is it has a truly velvet-like texture. That velvety feeling is actually on the front of the leaves, the back of the leaves, and on the stems themselves. You can kind of like feel them and they almost feel like Muppet arms. They're super cool. It truly feels like a fuzzy, soft, beautiful blanket. It is just the nicest thing. I highly recommend, even if you don't want to buy one of these, if you see one of these in the store, give it a full, give it a full on leaf pet. You won't regret it. You will understand why so many people have fallen in love with this plant, myself included. I do also want to point out, because I do have some new growth going on, what the new growth looks like. It's going to be a little hard because it's this little tubular thing. 
but it comes up in these nice little spirals. It comes straight from the base of your cluster and then it'll grow just like that. Luckily, this one in particular is actually in its own brand new cluster. It is spread off from this cluster right here. So that's really cool. That means the plant is spreading and it's happy for the most part. If a cluster does already exist, it'll grow kind of like this section here where it fans out and it'll grow from the centerpiece. Uh, Bird of Paradise is like this and most Calatheas exhibit this same sort of behavior. This thing is also extremely heavy to hold up the entire video. So if I get tired and have to put this down, please forgive me. I actually waited to water this specifically so it wouldn't be quite so heavy that I could actually lift it this whole video and I'm already tired. So we'll see how this goes. On to watering. So for this plant, I highly recommend thoroughly watering it every single time you water with either rainwater or distilled. I know that's a pain. If you want optimal growth for this plant, that is what I recommend. I personally have a reverse osmosis system that is built into my kitchen sink and I use that to water it because it's about as close to distilled as you can get in your home for not that much money. The main reason for that is to remove the amount of salts and minerals in your water. This plant is very sensitive to those things and it can get more brown tips, it can get brown edges, and it can just kind of not look quite as cute. So if you do want to use tap water, you don't want to go through the hassle, you already have one, you've been watering it with regular tap water this whole time and it's been fine absolutely leave it alone. Like my plant still gets brown tips, so don't take it personally if you're using tap water and you get a couple brown tips. That's just bound to happen with Calatheas and Capercias in general. One thing that I did when I was still watering with tap water for other plants, not necessarily my Calatheas, I did buy distilled water from the grocery store for these plants just because I didn't have an insane number of Calatheas. Soil-wise, I would highly recommend using aerating material in your soil mixture. Even if you are buying a mixed soil from your hardware store, plant store, whatever, generally what comes out of the bag is going to be a little too moisture retaining, even for Calatheas, even though they really, really like moisture. How it comes from the store is almost built for like a peace lily that likes being almost borderline wet constantly. Calatheas like to stay moist, but they do need to dry out a little bit because they are very susceptible to root rot because their roots are itty bitty teeny tiny. So that means they're very delicate and very prone to rot if you do let it sit in water as if it was a peace lily. So I do not recommend doing that. For all the Marantaceae family, Calatheas, Crucia, Maranta, that's all in the Marantaceae family, I would highly recommend if you pick out aerating material, pick ones that are a little bit on the smaller side. Your pumice, small bits of orchid bark, perlite, that is what I use as my aerating material when I make my own soil mix for these plants. If you want the easiest means of soil mixture for a plant like this and you want the most minimal amount of fuss possible, I would buy a standard potting mix for indoor plants and then, a, you know, a good quality one, whatever you want to pick out, and then a bag of cactus soil and mix that at a ratio of about a third to a quarter of the cactus mix with your potting soil. That is, generally speaking, the kind of ratio I would use for a plant like this. Personally, I mix my own from scratch, but if you don't want to deal with all of that, by no means do you have to. That's just what I choose to do. One big thing about Capercia, Calathea, this plant is no different. I would highly recommend not repotting it unless you absolutely have to. These things do not like their roots disturbed at all. So whatever nursery pot you buy your plant in, as much as you can, I would just keep it in that nursery pot until you have to pot it up. You'll also see that I have mine in a self-watering pot. You can see that it is empty right now. The soil still has a good amount of moisture in it because you know, after the water dries out of here, that doesn't necessarily mean that the soil is dried out yet. It is on the way to drying out, but it is not quite there yet. Most Marantisia plants do not like drying out. They usually have a three to four day window before they are upset that you have not watered them. 
The Warsco SGI is very similar. I do think that these can kind of stand to dry out a little bit more than your standard Calathea. What I'll do to see if the plant needs water is I will basically check on the top half inch to an inch of soil. If it's dry, then I will thoroughly water, or in the case of my self-watering pot, I will refill the reservoir. Once you notice that the soil on the top is getting a little dry, go ahead and water it. These do not have a very high tolerance for being underwatered. You will lose leaves quickly if you are not watering it. I put mine in the self-watering pot basically for ease of mind. It just helps with my watering tasks when I'm doing things sort of day to day. It gives me a little bit of leeway that a regular pot does not have. For temperature, I would say typical room temperature is fine. I would stick to, you know, above 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. As long as you stay above that temperature, you should be fine for all Calatheas like this, especially this one with the big paddle leaves. I really do not recommend shipping this plant to you in the middle of winter. You will lose a lot of leaves that way. And it's kind of twofold why, because it's without light and it's getting less light when it comes out of the box because it's winter time. But also the cold really affects the leaves more than most plants, I would say. And if you happen to be buying this plant locally, ask for like a bag or something and basically put a barrier so that this isn't getting hit by the ice cold wind having like just a bag over it should help just the walk to your car but generally speaking i just probably wouldn't buy it at all in winter i am actually doing very well so far this year not buying any plants this winter i'm very proud of myself Humidity is key for this plant, much like other Calatheas. Humidity and lack thereof is not going to kill your plant, but it will certainly make it less happy and less cute looking. I keep mine in my plant room, which is basically my spare bedroom that is completely filled with plants. And the humidity in that room stays at about 45%. In the winter time, my heater luckily has a humidifier attached to it, so I have not had to use individual humidifiers in order to keep the humidity in my house up. So it sticks around 45%, and that has been treating this plant pretty well. You know, I've got a couple of leaves with marks on them, but overall I think that's more to do with watering and maybe it being pot bound, because I am pretty sure that this needs to come out of this pot. I just haven't done it yet because I am lazy. I am very lazy. Of course, this plant would like as much humidity as reasonably possible that you're willing to offer it. For Calatheas, I will say that as it gets used to your home, gets used to the conditions you're giving it as far as watering, light, humidity, it will kind of adjust to your settings that you have at your home. So anything grown while you own it is going to be a lot hardier than what you brought home. But yes, I would say the Worsco SGI is a little less picky about humidity than some other Calatheas, the White Fusion in particular. That White Fusion really, really likes high humidity. This one can stand to be a little bit lower. I will put a nice little breakdown here of all of the sort of categories, I would say, for this particular plant. Like I said, mine's in 45% and it is doing just fine. On to light. The Worsco SGI definitely prefers medium indirect light and the keyword in there is indirect. You definitely want to avoid direct sunlight if at all possible. I would definitely not put this in like a dark bathroom with no window, but it could probably stand to be in a bathroom if there's a decent window in it that's not north facing and it doesn't have to be in the window itself. As long as it's getting a good amount of sort of ambient indirect light, it should be pretty good. I currently have my plant sitting on a shelf that is right next to one of my IKEA cabinets that have grow lights built into them. And I will definitely take some measurements to know exactly how many like lumens and foot candles my plant is currently getting. It's been in that spot for, I don't know, maybe like a month and a half at this point. And I can definitely say before that month and a half, it was not getting very good light at all. It was basically sitting on the floor. I had issues getting shelves in. It was a whole thing. No worries, it's on a nice lovely shelf now. The light that is in the cabinet next to this plant and the amount of light it gives off, that light is on for 14 hours a day. I have it on a timer so that every single day it gets the exact same amount of light and light output. Also about five feet away, there is a Western facing window that also gives it a little bit of light, not a ton, but a little bit of light. 
and that amount of light measurement I will put down below for you. It's like I'm lifting a child, I had to switch sides real quick. On to pests, everyone's favorite subject, especially when it comes to Clathias and Capercias, because bugs love these plants. I have had a recurring issue with spider mites pretty much since I've had plants. Most of the pest treatments I do for spider mites deals with all the other pests, so I have not had, and knock on wood, but I have not had scale, thrips, really a gnat problem. I haven't had mealybugs. Spider mites is really the only thing I have. So I credit the amount of spider mite treatments I do for why I don't get the other pests. For this particular plant, I have had to battle spider mites on it a couple of times. Not super bad though. One thing I find interesting about this plant is it seems to be a little hardier when dealing with spider mites. And maybe this is a fluke, maybe it's just my plant, but every time I've caught it on this plant, it is because I'm looking for it, not because the plant looks unwell. And because I love this plant so much, and because it is so precious to me, I do a thorough treatment of this at least once a quarter, kind of just as a preventative to make sure that even if it does get spider mites, it's never gonna be that bad. My rule of thumb is basically, if you are watering your plant, check it for bugs as you're watering it. That way you're giving it at least like a weekly or bi-weekly sort of check to make sure that everything is okay. And if you happen to see any sort of signs of a bug, pull it, put it in quarantine and basically set it aside for treatment. When you do your treatments, I would recommend doing them at night so that the water droplets and alcohol, whatever you happen to be using, those little water droplets can basically act like a magnifying glass and can damage the plant, basically enhancing sun stress. So doing the treatment at night allows it plenty of time to dry so that you don't have to worry about that. I have a few videos on my my spider mite treatment, which I do think works very well for other types of bugs as well. I will link them down below, but generally speaking, I will do treatments on the plants when they have actual spider mites. And as a preventative, I do have just like a bottle of my Captain Jack's solution, which is my preferred treatment method. And then I just spray the whole thing down like once a month, maybe even if there's no bug problems, I'll just do like a turn it around. And then you're done. As far as likelihood of getting pests, for me it's just the spider mites and it seems to only happen when it's near another plant who has it and generally speaking it hasn't been a recurring problem it's just kind of intermittent when it happens to get them probably due to my my treatments my quarantine methods all of those types of things it hasn't gotten bugs the way that some of my other calatheas have gotten bugs so I'm overall pretty happy with how resilient this plant is. The plant is more likely to have pest issues if you have lower humidity and if you are forgetting to water it too often. I would recommend if you catch this plant thoroughly underwatered where the soil is very, very dry, I would do a full on pest treatment during that and maybe keep a close eye on it and give it a lot of extra sprays just to make sure because bugs love plants when they're at their most vulnerable. And when it's low humidity or underwatering or both, that's definitely a perfect storm for having pests. I only fertilize in the growing season for me in the Northern Hemisphere. That means I stop at the end of October and I pick it back up again sometime in March. There's not like an exact science to it for me. I just kind of stop whenever I feel like it and start again whenever I feel like it. For Calatheas and the Warskweskii, what I recommend is using an organic fertilizer and whatever ratio they tell you on the bottle, divide it by half again, and then I only fertilize every other watering. So if it's a time when you're watering and it calls for like a half a teaspoon per gallon of water, what I do is I put a quarter teaspoon per gallon of water and I only do that every other time. As far as unhappy leaves go, I would recommend, even though they've got blemishes like this, leave it on the plant. Unless the whole leaf is starting to deteriorate, I would just leave it on the plant if you can stand it. Calatheas are gonna have a ton of little brown spots. Like I've got this one in pretty good shape and it has still got little brown spots. I've got some examples of like sad leaves and this one is starting to yellow. You can see that the green is not quite as 
deep green and it's almost looking like a more medium tone green. It's got the yellow edges and it's also got the tips on the bottom. So this leaf is probably on the way out. I could chop it back if I felt like it, but I choose not to. I'm gonna let it kind of dwindle down a little more, but I do have a prime example here of what a bad leaf looks like because I cut it off just before this video and it looks like this. So if my leaves start getting these super yellow edges like this and it's starting to get spotty like that, I cut it off. All this is doing is eating up nutrients for no reason. So when it gets to this point where like, it looks like the leaf's about to go, just cut it off. Save the plant the trouble. It'll start producing new leaves and put that energy into new leaves instead of trying to sustain something that's already gonna die. I will say when this one needs water, it does get droopy and you're like, Sarah, how does it get droopy? It, it's already kind of droopy. You can just kind of tell, I think, like what I'm picturing when I think of when it's droopy, because this has a nice roundness to it, it'll kind of seem more like a sag as opposed to like a springy kind of leaf. Also, one thing that can happen to this one is some of the edges can kind of curl in and make it kind of look like crispy potato chip edges. So that's another way to know if it needs water and it is underwatered. If it gets to that point, that is when you should be doing your pest treatments. Because basically, if you can tell that the plant needs water as far as this one goes, you're definitely going to need to do those pest treatments because it is struggling. As far as troubleshooting goes, I always go for the same exact steps no matter what plant it is, and this plant is no different. If you see that your plant is struggling, I would do the following. Step one, I would check the soil. If it is too dry, that means you need to water it. If it's too wet, and it's that means it's been wet for a minute, you might need to repot and change out your soil to something a little more aerating. One thing I will do if my plant is not drying out, I will stick little skewers into the soil to kind of force aerate it without repotting the whole thing so that it gets some air into the pot itself so that it can you know, circulate and dry out the soil so that it is not constantly moist, which leads to root rot. So if the soil is too dry, you water it. If it's too wet, try and figure out a way to aerate it without disturbing the plant too much. And in extreme cases, repot the plant. Second step, I would check for pests. For spider mites, for me, they are generally going to be, I'll use my dead leaf as an example. I know at least when it comes to spider mites, they love hanging out in this little divot right here. There's like a nice little seat for them to sit in. Also, they will be on the back of the leaves where they will be sitting on the inside of the ridge and they will also be kind of along the sort of veins right here. They just, that's where they will accumulate. Mealybugs and thrips will kind of be in the same areas. They do like the nooks, but they will also be on the front of the leaves as well as the back of the leaves. But yeah, look at the leaf, turn them over, check multiple leaves, don't just check one. So step three, I would say, is just to make sure that your soil is not compacted or otherwise look off. You know, this kind of goes back to step one, but you want to see, because sometimes I'll have dry soil and I'll water it, and then two days later it's dry again. And I'm like, well, that seems odd because that's not the kind of soil mix I have. It's not cactus mix, why is it doing this? And a lot of times it can be because the soil gets very compacted. So it'll just kind of run out of the sides or run off, run down little channels, but not actually saturate the whole thing. So definitely check to make sure when you're watering it as well, like that the soil is actually getting moist and not just stay like wet on the top and then everything else is dry. And no matter what, no matter what the problem is, I will check those three first and foremost, no matter what. The other two things I would check for this plant in particular is I would check the light situation. If it is producing really small leaves, it is not growing super fast, give it a little bit more light if you can help it. And also if you are getting sun bleaching or if it is constantly you can kind of tell the way it's growing. If it's growing like away from the light, that probably means it's getting too much light. So you want to kind of pull it back a little bit so it's in that sweet spot. Fifth and final thing, check your humidity. If you're getting brown, crispy edges and you're using the proper water, you don't have pests, it's got good light, it seems to be growing okay, but it just has really crispy edges, it's probably just the humidity. And that's something you can either amend yourself by getting a humidifier or using some sort of humidity increasing technique or just deal with having brown tips. It's not going to kill the plant. It's just not going to look quite as cute. That concludes this video all about the Calathea warskoweskii. What do you think? Do you want to try it out? Do you have these at home? Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite plants. When I did my Q&A a little bit ago, uh, I got asked the question, you know, if you can only have one plant like your house was on fire, which one would you grab? 
and I wanted to grab this one. So that tells you a lot about what I think about this plant. It is strangely hardier than most Calathea and Gapertia, at least from my experience. I have not had very many issues with this plant. It's almost like this plant has a will to live, which a lot of Calatheas don't have. So it's definitely a good one. I do think it grows fairly easily. I do lose leaves. You can kind of tell with this new growth on top that it has some brown tips straight out of the womb. And that generally means that in my case, it either has pests or it was underwatered. In this case, it was underwatered. So that is 100% my own fault. But it's a little hardier than you would imagine by looking at it. It kind of looks like it has a lot of issues with like the velvets and stuff. They might attract more bugs. I have not found that to be the case. I definitely love this plant. It is one of the few Calathea that I would, I would actually recommend to most people as long as your humidity is above 40%. I would try it out. It's not too bad. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe down below. I post videos every Thursday. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you next time. Bye. Try and tell me that's not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen.